God's love for us. It's talking about how God poured out all of himself for us. It's talking about how God did everything he could to attain to us. It's talking about how God's desire is unto us. Now, what we've done, guys, is we've come in and we've choked that out of the lives of people because we've made the gospel about how we pour ourselves out for God. We made the gospel about our love for God. We made the gospel about how we can attain to God, how we can attain to his acceptance, how we can attain to his blessing, how we can attain to his life, how we can attain to the status of a son. That ain't the gospel. And in the same way, we, when we can think about his love for us and fellowship with that, you notice how your eyes just kind of come off of yourself, really, looking at what you can do, and all you're thinking about is what he did? And as all you're doing is thinking about what he did, magically you find yourself experiencing happiness in life in that place. And so the serpent wants to come and get you to think about all that you can do, wants to get you to think about what you should do, in the same way that when we sit and just think about what God has done for us, how he emptied himself for us, how he wanted to attain us, how his desire is unto us. The same way that we think about that, and when we think about that, we can just become happy and feel free and full of love. When we think about it from the opposite way, it chokes all that out. When we think about how the gospel is how we pour ourselves out for God. When we think about how the gospel is about how we're supposed to love God. When we think about the gospel is about us attaining to God. About how our desire is supposed to be unto God. That will get your eyes off of God and what he's done and thought of you. And it will get your eyes on yourself. And in that moment is the moment you will feel separated from that life we just all experienced. And that's what the serpent wants to come and do. He wants to come and point at you. Have you really loved God like you should this week? Have you really loved people the way you should this week? Listen, man, that ain't the voice of God. The voice of God, even if, even if he finds us in the place where we're not experiencing his love and we're not finding his love pouring out of us, he doesn't come and ask us if we've loved the way we're supposed to. He comes with the word of his love for us. He doesn't come with the word telling us we lack. The Bible says the Lord is your shepherd and he leads you into a place where you no longer believe you lack anything. So listen, if you're going somewhere and hearing a word about how you lack and about have you loved like you should, have you loved God the way you should this week, have you done enough for God, have you served the kingdom of God, if you're hearing that kind of a thing, that ain't the voice of God. Nor can that bring forth the kingdom of God inside of a human being. That brings forth the kingdom of death. That brings forth laboring and toiling, striving to attain to something and someone who has emptied himself out to attain to us. <laughs> it can blow your mind when you realize that guy wanted to attain to us. Because we've all the time been growing up in a land, in a world, where we've all the time been taught how we've got to attain to him. <laughs> Changes the whole dynamic. It's the difference between thinking that you're a, a servant in the house of the Lord to knowing that you're a son or a daughter in the house of the Lord. Big difference. Big difference between knowing you're a son or a daughter and, and thinking that you're a servant in the house of the Lord. You know, my wife and I, when we first moved here, we, didn't, we hadn't found a place to live yet, and we had to live with my parents. You know, my wife hadn't grown up in the house of my parents. You know, they call her daughter, and she calls them mom and dad, but she hadn't grown up in the house of my parents. So she was a little, like, leery of what she could necessarily do in the house. And I would walk around the house and just do what, whatever I wanted to do. I would just go open up the refrigerator, up in the cabinets, eating the food, drinking what they had, eating the candy, searching them out for more. What do you got? Can I have it? Give it to me. You see, she, because she hadn't grown up in the house of my parents, she had this idea that some of it might not be for her. And she's got to be walking on tiptoes. You see, but I grew up in the house of my parents, and so I knew I was a son. And so, listen, the son's not busy thinking about, can I have that? The son is busy thinking about, what's my parents' is mine? You see? Completely different dynamic, man. And it changes the life you experience. I mean, sometimes, and I, listen, I would have felt the same way if I was staying with her parents. So this isn't to disparage Becky, but, man, I stressed her out sometimes with the stuff I was doing. You know, she's wondering if I'm being respectful of my parents' generosity. 
you know, and I kept trying to tell her, I'm a son. <laughs> and listen, it was my parents' good pleasure that I do that. It wasn't some skin off their back. They weren't busy thinking, well, Greg's not respectful enough. Greg's not being reverent. He needs to recognize the holiness of us. No, they were tickled pink that I felt so comfortable with them and in their house that I would walk around free, innocent. That's how God feels. God's not busy thinking, well, my kids, they're not being reverent enough to me. They're not aware enough of my holiness. You know how you're aware of the holiness of God? Holiness just means to be set apart unto something. You realize the holiness of God, you're reverent of his holiness when you realize he has a spirit in himself that is the Holy Spirit, and he is set apart unto giving you life and loving you into his life in himself. That's how you reverence the holiness of God. You realize you can't bring forth life through your own ability, and you realize it's his good pleasure to give you his life for a free gift. Now you're reverent of God. Reverence is not... It's not all dressed up in my tuxedo and got everything. It's, that's not reverence, man. Reverence looks like innocence. Reverence looks like innocence. <laughs> you're reverent of the holiness of God when you feel so innocent in his presence that you're not aware of what you're doing or saying and whether or not he's scrutinizing it. Mm. That's reverence, man. <laughs> you're aware of the spirit that he set apart unto. And now you're fellowshipping with him based on that same spirit. And so you're also set apart unto the spirit that he has in himself. That's reverence, man. And when you're reverent, you know you're being reverent because you get a big smile on your face and you feel happy. And you feel like that guy is so happy with you that you don't feel any type of barrier to any type of behavior with him. So if that means you want to run up and give that guy a high five, bam. You know, one of my messages I talked about, in the day Jesus returns and I can play basketball with Jesus, I want to dunk on Jesus. That isn't irreverent. It's just saying I want to enjoy life with Jesus. And I've never been able to dunk, and I want to dunk. You see, but I, I'm so reverent of God's holiness. I'm so aware of the spirit he set apart unto. I feel so comfortable with him. I feel so much in union with him that I don't feel like he'll be upset or angry for me to say something like that. But even the moment I say something like that, the religious mind is like, whoa, Greg, you're going to dunk on Jesus? I don't know, man. Can, can we say that? Is, is Greg about to get struck down dead? <laughs> right? That's the immediate thought, right? Did that guy just say that? You see, the funny thing is, that's reverence to God. Because I know it doesn't upset God, and I'm acknowledging the spirit that he's of, and I'm acknowledging and I'm aware that he's so happy that I can feel so comfortable with him that I know he wouldn't be upset in me playing basketball with him and us dunking on each other. You know, my friend won't be upset if I dunk on him. He'll think, man, you finally dunked. He'll be happy. Same way with God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When I finally dunk, God's going to be like, high five, buddy. Let's try it from the free throw line now. I believe I can fly. <laughs> right, right now? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. You guys see what I'm saying? I said a lot. Hopefully you see what I'm saying.